Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every person who's here, and we pray that as your word goes out, that hearts will be softened, that we'll hear what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. Amen. I've shared this probably maybe a couple times before, and I don't know if people believe me, but I could have been a professional rugby player. I was that good. You might not think of that because of my stature. You might think, uh, what does this small guy know about rugby? But I was very good. And even in the fourth year, I was voted as the best rugby player. So I was on my way. And, and I think I was going to make it. And I always had this dream that, you know, I'll be like a rugby player first, you know, make all this money, and then give all that up, you know, to be a preacher. And then it'll be all out in the news that preacher man gives, uh, you know, that professional rugby player stops rugby to go preach. But I could have been. And, uh, and, and I was pursuing it, and uh, I, I played it in Zimbabwe. Then I came over here, and I played it in high school as well. Uh, and then I went to university. So then in university, they had these things they call tryouts. So trials. So I was like, I've got this because I'm good at rugby, and I'm going to make it. So we go to the tryouts. And um, I made it. I'm surprised. No, I didn't make it. <laughs> I did not make it. But, 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 but to my defense, to my defense, there was uh, a very legitimate reason of why I did not make it. It was not because of my skill. It was not because of my size. Like I said, I was good in rugby. But what had happened was, when I was in Zimbabwe, I had only played under sunlight, you know, under the sun. So then I come to Ireland, I come to the Western world, and the trials are at night. So there are these floodlights just beaming. So there I'm there, you know, trying to do my skill, and the ball would go up. And everybody's like, oh, catch it, catch it. And I'm, going, I'm trying to do this. I miss the ball because the lights, the lights get into my eyes. And because of the lights, I was not able to be selected. So that's my story, and I am sticking with it. If it had not been for the floodlights, I would have been an Irish rugby player. But, um, but why am I talking about trials? I'm talking about trials because uh, of James. Uh, so in James chapter 1, uh, verse 2, it tells us this. And, and, and we've been doing James as a church, like in the young adults, in the youth, and we've been doing it as our midweek as well. So even in your quiet times, if you can also kind of read James so that we're together, and if you've got any questions, that, um, you know, then you can kind of ask the leaders. So James says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. So there's this idea of there are trials. Like in life, there are trials. Like God, James tells us that God tests us and that it is for our good. And of course, like when we're going through the trials, it is tough. Do you know, like when your health is failing, when you have no money, when you have lost your job, or when a friend has betrayed you or swindled you out of thousands of euros, it hurts. But the Bible tells us that these trials come you know, to, to, to test us and to prepare us so that in the end, we are mature, complete, and not lacking in anything. But, but, but one thing, one of my pet peeves is this. Do you know sometimes when you read like uh, the newspapers or you... Uh, you, you're on the internet, you see these before and after, right? People are like, oh, this is me before and this is me after. Or, or rags to riches, right? They tell you, oh, I had nothing and now I'm a millionaire. Those things really annoy me because I'm like, do you know what? Don't tell me the outcome. Tell me how is it that you were able to achieve this? You know, that's just kind of gloating and, and, and saying, tell us 
how we achieve it. So today, we're going to be talking about, it's all well and good to talk about when you come out the other side of the trials. However, during the trials, what are we meant to do? Are you going to be like me and be ill-equipped, not ready to deal with the floodlights? Or are you going to be equipped for the trials of life? Because if you live long enough, you will suffer. This is just the reality of life. Trials will come your way, but are you going to be prepared? And, and I'm telling you, you, you see it in the Bible. You see it in Joseph. He suffers. His brothers sell him to slavery. You see it in Job. He suffers so much. You also see it in Jesus. I get in the theme here. If your name is starts with a J, you're in trouble. You see, <laughs> Job <George. laughs> So the J's in the Bible don't seem to be having a good time. Even James starts with a J. So guys, parents, don't name your kids anything starting with a J because it seems like they get more suffering. But uh, just messing, guys. Suffering comes to everybody. Trials come to everyone. But today, I want us to be prepared. I want us not to be ill-equipped because when trials come, that's when that temptation comes. God doesn't care for you. Or even people who are advising you might tell you, remember Job's wife tells, his, tells her husband, just curse God and die. Right? That was advice. Because his suffering had been so great. But if Job had not been prepared, he would have done that. But Job knew better. He says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So guys, trials are coming. <laughs> Trials are guaranteed. But how would you know you will make it to the other side? We just don't want those photos on Facebook of people. I was here and now I've made it. Today we're going to be talking about how we make it through the trials. And to do that, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. We're in Matthew chapter 4. And talking about trials is always tough because I know like right now people are going through things. But I hope today, this is not, uh, oh, it's going to be okay in the future. I hope this will speak to you today. This will speak to you now. So Matthew chapter 4. I'll just add a little bit more commentary as we go. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And let me just uh, add a little bit of commentary. Uh, do you know when you watch sometimes those commercials that goes, don't try this at home? This is kind of one of those, uh, don't be trying to fast 40 days and 40 nights. Do you know, like, let's just start with one. Let's do, you know, one day a week. That'll be good. So this is one of those of uh, um, handle with care. So after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter, which is the devil or Satan, Diablos, whatever you want to say, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil knows scripture, guys. Jesus answers him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him 
and the angels came and attended him. So what is happening here? I'll just do a quick recap. So just after Jesus' baptism, where he's confirmed as the Son of God, you know, heaven breaks open and he says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately he's taken by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And then there are three temptations that come Jesus' way. And do you realize, do you, what I want to hone in on, there's so many things we can be talking about, but what I want to hone in on is how Jesus fights these temptations. It is God's word. So essentially, if you could take one thing from this service, it is this. Face your trials with God's word on your lips. Face trials with God's word on your lips. Which ties in well to our series where we're talking about the weight of words. And what is weightier than the word of God? So sometimes we talk about, right, be slow to speak, right? Slow to anger, quick to listen, right? Because sometimes when you speak too quickly, you just speak things that are not right. However, if you want to be 100% sure that you are right, speak the word of God. And in context, because we will see that the devil is very clever, speaking the word of God, but out of context. As we say, a text without a context is a con. So if the devil comes to you and twists scripture, do you know enough of the word of God to be able to point it out and say, no, 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 no. It is also written this. But as we say, our series, right, of life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. But now with the powerful tongue, we want to be speaking the word of God. When those trials come, we want to be speaking the word of God. But, but I hope now as, as I'm speaking, you, you start going, but, but pastor, you're talking about trials, but this passage is talking about fighting temptation. Like as Beyonce said, right? We're just fighting temptation, right? It's like, it's like this is temptation. So, so what, what, why are you talking about trials? I'm glad you ask. If you didn't ask, I'm asking it for you. If you look into your Bible, right, uh, there'll be like a, a little um, subscription on it, like where it says tempted. If you look at that, at the bottom it says, the Greek for tempted can also mean tested. So the very same word, and with this context, can also mean trials. So that very word is the idea of testing and temptation, which actually fits nicely into verse 1. So, so let me just read verse 1 again. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the, the wilderness to be tested. But how is it going to be tested? By temptations from the devil. So in the very same action, God is testing Jesus is testing Jesus' obedience. What we have learned about from James, right? Consider it all joy that in trials, there's this testing, right? So that you endure, so that you be complete, you be mature. So this is what God wants to do. But this side, you've got the devil in the very same action wanting harm. Later, the, the, the music team is going to lead us into a song with this line. And when we sing this song, just think of this verse. What the enemy meant for evil, you meant it for good. Just, just think about let, Let's go back to, to, to our J's again. Think about Joseph, his brothers selling into slavery. What do they mean? They mean harm. They mean harm. But God will say in Genesis 50 verse 20, what they intended for evil, I intended for good. Think about Job. What the devil intended for evil, 
What was God doing? He was doing good. Think about the cross. Jesus dying on the cross. The people who crucified Jesus, the religious leaders, the, 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 the rulers, what are they doing? They are doing harm. And they are culpable for what they've done. But in that very action is why we can say we can test victory. Not because we are strong, but because Jesus is the one who achieved the victory. So I want you to see your trials in a big picture. And here's the thing with trials. They come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all shapes and sizes. It might be health. It might be marriage, it might be finances, whatever it is, it comes in all shapes and sizes. It might be suffering, but trials can come as temptations as well. That are you going to withstand temptation? And here's the thing about temptations. They can come from the devil, or they can come from us. So, so listen to what James says. Like in James chapter 1, do you have James chapter 1 verse 13? Because in James chapter 1, we've got that sequence, right, of, ah, there we go. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt. And then in 14, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it will give birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, will give birth to death. You see, even how temptation comes, it can come from the devil, it can come from you, it can come from the world, people telling you stuff, it can come from your friends, it comes in all shapes and sizes. So that's why even in in this sermon, I don't want to concentrate too much on exactly the nature of the trial because each one of us here are unique and we're facing different trials. Or even the, the source of the temptation or the trials, again, because they are varied. However, how we fight it, that is the same. We fight it with God's word on our lips. So, so, so I'm just going to sort of like move quickly from 3 to, 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 to 9 as I just kind of show you how Jesus is fighting temptation here. And don't, do, and don't uh, put up the defense of saying, no, I can't do that because that's Jesus. Because Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us this. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. This is important. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. But even when Jesus was tempted, he did not sin. And Jesus will see him when we go back to Matthew using the word of God to fight temptation. So the first temptation comes this way. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I find that quite fascinating. The devil has the audacity to question your identity. Comes for your identity. If you're the son of God. And and like I said, this incident happened immediately after the baptism where Jesus is confirmed as the son of God. And the devil comes, are you really the son of God? You see, and this is massive, don't miss this, because if you don't understand your identity, you're lost as to your purpose. Like right now I'm using this microphone as my amplifier. The fact that I can identify it as a microphone tells me the meaning of it and its purpose. But if you lose the identity of what it is, then you can use it for anything. So identity is important, and the devil knows this and comes if you're the son of God. 
And Jesus doesn't even dignify it with an answer because he knows he's the Son of God. So I ask you, do you know your identity? If you're a Christian, do you know your identity in Christ? That you are in Christ, that you are chosen, that you're not forsaken. And no matter what trials come your way, you're an adopted son and daughter of God. Do not miss your identity. And if you're not a Christian, let me tell you, you are created in the image of God. And because you're created in the image of God, you've got worth, you've got value. So when those negative thoughts come into your mind and tell you that you are worth nothing, nobody cares for you, that is not true. Because of the very nature of your identity, the fact that you have a creator who created you gives you value, gives you meaning, gives you purpose. So don't let anyone tell you different, especially when you're going through trials. That's when we're so weak. Right? The devil comes to Jesus when? When he was most vulnerable, right? After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, right? He's hungry. He's tired. And at that moment, that's when the devil wants to strike. But just listen to what Jesus says. He doesn't even dignify it with an answer. He just quotes scripture. It's, if you want to know, it's, between, it's in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 6, 7, 8. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what is interesting, what is referred to in that chapter is this idea, you know, like when God provides manna or bread uh, for the Israelites to, to, to live on. You would think that is the impressive part. But actually, that passage is saying, no, no, that's not the impressive part. The impressive part is the God who said. See, the God who speaks. The God who said there will be manna and there was manna. That is the person whom we listen to. Not our trials. Not our hardships. We listen to the word of God. But the devil doesn't give up. So he takes Jesus to a high point. And this this was probably the the tallest building at that time. Takes him maybe to the Dublin Spire or something, something really high, and says, okay, throw yourself. And quotes scripture. A famous one is, well, do we have some, uh, if we could put Psalm 91 verse 1. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That is the the, the start of that psalm, and he's just talking about God's protection. And I'm saying, God's going to protect you. Just jump. But the devil is twisting Scripture. Jesus is wise to his tactics, and he says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, and he quotes scripture. Guys, like I said, trials are inevitable. Suffering is inevitable. Don't go out looking for them. Don't do, you know, so, so if you're in a period of no trials, if that's ever possible, please savor it. Enjoy it. Don't be going out there looking for trials. Because trials will come. Because Ecclesiastes tells us that, you know, it, when you're having good times, be happy and have good times because bad times will come. And when they do come, don't curse God. Consider that God has made one as well as the other because it is only God who knows what's going to happen after we leave this place. So don't go out looking for trials. And Jesus knows this, so he quotes scripture. But then the devil is not finished. Then he takes him up in eight, right? to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and splendor. I don't know if you've ever been, what's that thing called? The merry-go-round? Is it the merry-go-round or the Ferris wheel? Ferris wheel. Okay, the London Eye. He takes him to the London Eye. And he's, he's on the London Eye. He can see the splendor of the kingdoms of the earth, right? It's like you can see the stadiums, the skyscrapers, the money, the houses, the cars, all this stuff. And the devil says, Just bow down to me, and all this I will give to you. You see what the devil is doing here? 
He is trying to give this without the necessity of the cross. In Philippians, we know that Jesus is exalted. Why? Because of his obedience unto death on a cross, then he was exalted. But the devil was saying, you don't have to go via the cross. I can give you this. But then the devil was like, then Jesus is like, no, I will not bow down to you. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the, the devil left and the angels came and attended to Jesus, which is just a confirmation that God was pleased with what Jesus did. So I want to say to you, how well do you know the Word of God so that you can face trials with the Word of God on your lips? And this is an uncomfortable question because as I ask it, we, 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 you know, we, we start to get uneasy because deep down we know we're not very well versed in our Bibles. And I'm not saying this because I'm a preacher. I'll tell you a story later where you see that I too struggle with this. And, and you only need to uh, have a conversation maybe with uh, an unbelieving friend of yours to know that you don't know your Bible that well. They might just ask you a simple, innocent question. And, and you quake because you know you do not have the answer because you do not know your Bibles that well. But it doesn't need to be like that. It doesn't always have to be like that. There are atomic habits you can do to make sure you can know your Bible. As they say, right, how, how do you eat an elephant? Right, one bite at a time. I don't know why they want to eat an elephant, but there is an expression like that. I'm, I'm sure of it. If there's no expression that says that, I'm not a native speaker, so blame that. But, but, but the thing is, you cannot just keep staying with, I don't know my Bible. I don't know my Bible that well. And be comfortable with that, or even justify it. Because sometimes people will justify it and say, I love God. I'm not a Bible lover. I'm a God lover. I love God. But my challenge to you, you're loving a God that you do not know. Because God has disclosed himself in the Bible. Don't be like the Athenians that are praying to an unknown God. Pray to a God whom you know. A God who has disclosed himself clearly in the Bible. And, and I say this by, by going, I, I was a Christian, I've been a Christian since I was 10. And, and, and what happens when you're a Christian from that age, you pick up church lingo, right? So I would pick, pick up things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know where it came from. I just know I can do all things. God's got plans for me, plans to prosper me. There's hope. There's a future. God does not want to make me a tail. He wants to make me the head. I'm like, amen. So, so, so I remember where I was. I was a teenager, and I got told about the prosperity gospel. It didn't make sense with reality because they said, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be. You should be wealthy. You should be healthy. You should prosper. It sounded good. And that's what my itching ears wanted to hear, and I adhered to it, although in reality, it didn't live up to reality. I wasn't a millionaire. I got sick. I had flu. I had colds. So I was like, it actually is not true. But then I would pray, I know the plans God has for me. But, but I was taking it out of context. Do you know that verse that says, I know the plans I have for you. Do we have Jeremiah? I don't know if I gave you guys Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29. If, if not, it's fine. Yeah, no, no, okay, no Jeremiah. But okay, Jeremiah 29. <laughs> before that said, I know the plans that I have for you. Literally the verse before that is saying, 
Guys, stay put where you are. You're going to be there for 70 years. So, so, so you better be seeking the prosperity of where you are because you're going to be remaining in exile. So it wasn't a verse that is saying you will never face like hard times, that it's always going to be good because it wasn't good for them. They were in exile. They in a different country. They weren't worshiping in the temple that they wanted to be. But this was saying that despite all of that, in the end, God's going to come through for you. Right? This is what we're talking about when you talk about Romans 8, verse 28, right? That, you know, like, um, in all things, God works out for the good of those who love him. What are the all things? It's the good and bad. That in all that, God will work it out for the good of those who love him. So this is all to say, t- take seriously studying your Bible. And, and I'm, I'm going to uh, suggest how to, 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 to study your Bible. And this will actually, if you do this consistently every day, this will hold you in good stead. You start with a book like James, for instance. And, and, and read a couple of verses for yourself and ask these five questions. Don't look at commentaries. Don't look at study Bibles. Don't look at the daily bread. I know we've got daily bread there. I'll, 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 I'll explain myself. Read it for yourself. When you struggle with the text yourself, you can then go to daily bread with questions. And you've already put some answers. And then when you go to your daily bread or commentaries or study guides, you'll be like, oh man, I got that really wrong. But, but then you, you figure out where you got wrong so that the next time you know how to read it. So just read, pick a book like James, read a few verse, verses and ask these five questions. So what does it say? This is the first question. It's just a simple one. What does the passage say? So in our thing, what does the passage say? Jesus is taken into the wilderness and is tempted by the devil three times. And he fights it with scripture. This is what the passage says. So you're not even interpreting it. You're just saying, actually, what is it saying? And then the next bit is... What does it mean? That needs a little bit of digging, and I'm actually going to show you how, what this passage actually means um, in the context. Um, it's quite fascinating. I know we're talking about trials and all, but, 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 but the bigger meaning actually has to do with Jesus' success as the Son of God, where other sons of God have failed. But, but, but we'll, we'll touch into that uh, a little while. And then after that, what does it mean of God? Right? So, so what does it mean? Then? What does this mean? What does it show me about God? And we talked about this. Even in these trials, God means for good. Right? This is what it means. It means for good. And then what does it mean for you? It means you can't do it. You cannot do it on your own. Only Jesus could. If you were there and the devil came for you, you aren't going to make it. That's just the truth. And then how do you respond? So let me do those five questions again. So pick a passage of scripture, ask these five questions. I don't know why I'm doing four, five. Ask these five questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it tell mean about God? So, so the Bible is a book about God. Guys, it's not about us. It's actually about God rescuing. So you always need to ask the question, what does it tell me about God? And then after that, what does it tell us, t- t- tell us about us? Because the God, whom this is his Bible, cares about us and puts stuff in there for us as well. And then how to respond or how to apply. You've got to put it into action. Otherwise, it's just like paint that you buy. That's not applied if you don't apply to a war, then it's useless. You've got to apply it. But like, like I said, I, I want to now touch a little bit on what does it mean. Um, and, and, and this is not rocket science, guys. We, we all can do it. It's not just the preacher who can do it. Um, why is Jesus taken to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights? What does that sort of like remind you of? I hope that reminds you of the Israelites in the desert where they were for 40 years 
And do they pass their test or were they complaining and grumbling all the time? They failed. And I hope as well as we were reading even that temptation of the devil's tactic of if you're the son of God, where have we seen that before? It's not like in the Garden of Eden where the devil shows up again and what does he do? He questions the word of God. This is the tactic here. So, two sons of God. So, I'm going to give you some verses here. So, um, do you have Hosea? The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, and um, that was not the one. <laughs> it was, uh, somebody help me out. Hosea 11, chapter 1. Somebody who's fast. Hosea 11, chapter 1. Essentially, it says, out of Egypt, I will call my son. And the son there is Israel. If somebody has had it, please, please, please read it out so that people will say the preacher man isn't lying. So Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Thank you. So the point there is, Israel was God's son. And Israel failed to be obedient. And then I'm going to tell you of another son. Uh, do we have Luke chapter 3, 38? I'm sorry, guys. I threw out a lot of verses at you. So after the baptism, we then told the genealogy of Jesus. And if you like genealogies, you know, knock yourself out, you know, in Luke chapter 3. But at the end, it then goes, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Adam is also a son of God. And as a son, did he pass in the garden? He failed. And it's, it's very interesting that if you think about the temptations even in the garden, it was Eve who entertained the devil, the snake. But the responsibility fell on Adam because he was the leader. He was the head. So it's attributed to Adam. He was the one with ultimate responsibility. So even there we see leadership and headship, even from the very beginning. So but what I want you guys to see, what does it mean? So we've got two sons who have failed. Adam failed. Israel failed. But in here, Jesus succeeds. And this is just a foretaste of, of the success Jesus was going to have. He succeeds in these temptations. He has victory in these temptations. But ultimately, at the cross, do we have Philippians chapter 2? And being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, uh, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names. And then at the hands of Jesus, every knee, tongue, was going to bow. So, so, so the point is this. Israel failed in obedience. Adam failed in obedience. You failed in obedience. And you are guilty. But Jesus succeed, becoming the only one who is qualified to die on the cross so that your sins can be forgiven. So what does the passage mean? We bow down to Jesus. We go to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And we do not rely on ourselves. And now how do we respond? So after you have come to Jesus and you've accepted Jesus, now you live out, out of the gratitude. And that gratitude now leads you to fight temptation. Leads you to say, out of gratitude, you should face your trials with God's word on your lips. So even with that, I'm going to invite Ava, who's going to lead us into a song that touches on chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. What the enemy meant for evil, God 
intended for our good. So when we come to that line, please sing it out loud because you know, we will taste a victory, not because we're so awesome or great, but because Jesus is great, because Jesus has triumphed. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because where we failed, where we disappointed, where Israel failed, where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. Only true Son of God who was obedient, obedient even the point of death. So thank you for Christ. And now help us to emulate Christ and treasure God's word in our hearts so that we will know it to be able to face every trial with God's word on our lips. Amen.